Sit. Sit. This is Max, and this is Max's roadmap to success. I'm holding some treats to keep Max interested in me. Uh, Max is a little bit of a nipper, um, and I think that uh, he's not a bad nipper. Uh, the thing about dog nipping, when they nip to correct, usually they do it pretty consistently, and he is really not drawing blood. He did a couple occasions, but I think it was more coincidental. And so that tells me that he's just trying to warn people. He's not, he's not an aggressive dog. But basically, I think the problem here is his guardians didn't really, they had some rules, and they did good, a fairly good job of exercising. He's not a super high energy breed. Uh, but they, there were a lot of things that they did that confused the dog into thinking that he had more authority, like petting him for no reason. Um, only in the, in the dog world, only the dogs that are the leaders get affection or attention for no reason. Uh, also, uh, when he did things they didn't like, they would pet it. Also, he's a barker, and it gets to be a really annoying habit. And like a lot of us do, sometimes we yell at the dog to be quiet. But for dogs, if they're barking and we yell, we just think, they think, cool, now we're both barking or he agrees with me. Sit. Um, so whenever possible, uh, this is passive training. Uh, pet under the chin. Now, he sat on his own. I didn't ask him to sit. Passive training is just basically the, uh, the premise of any time a dog does a desired action or behavior, I'm going to reward the dog. Remember, you have three seconds to correct or reward your dog. Uh, I'm going to wait for the dog to do it voluntarily. And that's really kind of, if uh, the guardians are watching this, they should reflect on it, is a lot of what I do is not telling the dog or micromanaging what the dog, to, uh, what the dog does, it is waiting for the dog to do the thing that we want and not, and then giving them the affection. So when he SITs, there we go, sit. So I waited for him to sit. I, didn't, I wanted him to sit, but I didn't tell him to sit. I knew he was going to. And as soon as he did, he got a reward. So I call this turn the light switch on or turn the light switch off. On is giving him affection, attention, or a reward, a pet, something like that. Turning it off is stopping giving him those things. So this is a good example. Uh, a good example above is uh, the leash, uh, leashing technique video that's above us. As soon as he got excited, we stopped going through the process of leashing him. As soon as he sat down and he was calm, then the process started back up. So that's a real powerful way to work and communicate to your dog. And dogs go through association. So as soon as I get excited or do the wrong thing, the thing that I like stops happening. As soon as I sit down or calm down or do whatever the thing is that the human wants, the thing starts happening again. If your timing is precise and you repeat that a lot, the dog will figure this out. We went through a door claiming exercise um, after we shot the video above, and uh, which teaches the dog it has to stay at least seven feet away from the door. Well, I did it first, and by the time the guardian did it, we did it actually three times, the guardians both practiced, and then we actually coincidentally had a package that got delivered. When the package person came, he barked one time, and he went and stood outside of the, the boundary around away from the door without anybody prompting him to do so. Uh, now this is warm. When the guardians are uh, coming home, they're gonna practice this cold. He's probably gonna be more animated, more uh, go up there. But the more you practice it, the better at it he'll get. So I want the guardians to call or text each other when they're coming home so they can practice uh, teaching Max the proper way to behave when people come to the door. Um, and remember to go through all the little, you know, step by step. One of the guardians was trying to do sit was trying to do the handle and the deadbolt at the same time. Make sure each individual step by itself and click it multiple times before you do it, then go to the next step only when the dog has been able to achieve the behavior that you want for the previous step. I'm gonna hold this here to keep you uh, motivated. Now he, uh, I was showing his guardians, he doesn't like having a camera put in his face. And he was showing, he wasn't quite showing his teeth, but he was beginning to. You could see his whiskers move and his muscles were getting in the same position that it would be when he eventually uh, showed his teeth. Just like anything else, I can say no or no. And so dogs have alliteration in how, the, how much, how intense their communication is. And that's what he was saying is, I'm not, comfortable with, I'm not comfortable with you having a camera in my face. So we can either fix that problem or respect the dog and not put the camera in the dog's face. So watch for the little signs like that. He's probably gonna stare, show you a little bit of his teeth or make his whiskers move. Um, his tail probably is gonna go up. Um, and he might, he can stare like this or he can stare like this, looking off to the side. Uh, breathing heavy or holding his breath. These are signs of anxiety and stress. Licking the lips is a sign of stress. Turn the head to the side and yawning is a calming signal or a sign of stress. Crash. Good job, buddy. Um, so when we have guests come over, if we can watch the dog, so if your guest is gonna get up and use the bathroom, maybe say, hey, before you're gonna get up and get a glass of water or anything, please let me know. And then as soon as the dog, the guest like says, okay, I'm gonna cough twice to indicate I'm gonna get up, so they cough twice, you turn your attention to Max and you watch Max. And then if you see him start staring or getting stiff or showing some of those signs, you could actually preemptively disagree with him using the escalated consequences that I went with you, over with you off camera. If you have to, stand up and put yourself in between him and the guest. Um, 
Now, I think a lot of this is based on the fact that he thinks that he's doing his humans a service by being a guard dog. But they don't need him to be a guard dog. And again, a lot of their actions were confusing to him. So um, one of the things I started talking about a minute ago is passive training, which is basically just petting him every time he does something we want within that three second window. So if he puts his chin down on my knee, on my thigh, or there we go, so crash is the word that I like to use. I didn't tell him to, but as soon as he lies down, the human's all over me, petting me, and I hear the same command word, sit. So anything that, anytime he does a desired action, he gets attention, right? Most of us teach our dog to actually misbehave. When it barks, we yell at it. When it crosses the threshold, we march at it. When uh, you know, it jumps up, we shug it off or tell it to get down or whatever it is. Dogs, energy from us is good at energy and bad energy, chin. Or you call that bag or whatever the word is, but that's a specific act. So passive training, every time the dog does something specific, name it a single word command and then pet the dog and give it a little affection for it. You can also do it with these toys. Every time he brings you one of these toys, give a name for each one of these toys. Every time he brings you the orange thing, maybe call that orange or you know whatever it is, octopi, um, whatever it is. Um, also remember to come up with fun command words whenever possible because dogs can read your facial expression. So if you're smiling when you say a command word, it's gonna help the situation. Uh, now I also went over passive training, or oh, excuse me, depending on the purpose. Passive training is recognizing waiting for the dog to organically offer the behavior on its own without any influence of the human. Now I usually, usually say testify or recognize or reward. So if somebody says testify to me, I look at the dog and I'm gonna immediately narrate whatever the dog's doing when I pet it. So if I look at the dog and it's laying down, I pet him and say crash. That means that somebody else in the room saw the dog laid down and I missed the opportunity to reward him. So they say testify to me and I immediately just start petting the dog because again, I only have three seconds. Um, if he's standing, I pet him and say come. I assume he just came. If he's sitting, pet him and say sit or whatever. Uh, petting with a purpose is if he demands attention, we're not gonna give him that attention. Instead, we're gonna give him a counter order. He jumps up on us, we tell him to sit. When he sits, we pet him. And whenever possible, try to pet him under his chin to facilitate that he goes up and never pet him on top of the head. We can caress, we can scratch, just never pat. Um, and then we're gonna say just the command word, not good dog, no, no caveman talk. Good potty, bad sit, whatever it is. Just sit, come, stay. Saying good dog doesn't hurt your dog, but it doesn't help you. But if he comes and you pet him and say come, that does help you and it helps your dog. Also come up with a list of the command words. I think I found the guardians to be using variants of the word, come, come here, over here, here boy. And that means there's a lot of extra words he's gotta memorize. So instead, come up with a unique command word for each word, uh, each command. And again, the guardians should probably be teaching him some new commands. We'd like our dog to know at least 10 different commands. So what I'd like the guardians to do is start going to YouTube tomorrow, Sunday, maybe each week we take a turns and one of the guardians goes to YouTube, teach the dog to balance a treat on their nose. Start off with a really easy trick the first time you do it though. You wanna be able to complete it in like one day and then for the rest of that week, we're gonna practice that one trick. Sit, oh you are sitting. You're low to the ground guy. Uh, and then all, so we teach him to balance a treat on his nose and then once he's got it, we practice it all week long. Then the next guardian, uh, next week, the next guardian takes uh, a turn and teaches him bang your dead and he flops down or whatever these things are. Go get me a beer from the fridge, bring me my slippers, whatever it is. Um, the more skills that he has, the more confident he's gonna be. A lot of dogs that are reactive are doing so out of an insecurity. I don't think he's a supremely insecure dog. Crash, crash. So I could have given him a treat or just petted him. I did both. Um, I said crash but first and then I give him a treat and said crash again. And when I give a dog a command, I usually say it twice. Sit in the command stage. When the dog sits, I pet it on his chin and say sit again during the reward stage to connect the dots. Um, so uh, uh, teach him some new tricks and commands. If each guardian picks four new tricks, or commands, at the end of two months, he's got eight new skills, plus he's got about two or three now. Now he's got 11 skills. That's gonna really boost his self-esteem. Uh, let's see, what else do we go over? Uh, we went over, it's important for the guardians to eat first, and we're not gonna leave food in his bowl, we're not gonna pick up the whole bowl if he doesn't eat it. As soon as he walks away from his bowl, we pick up the bowl, we dump the food out of it, we put the empty bowl back down, and leave it there so that every time he walks by the bowl, I know, I'm sorry, buddy, these are the rules though, but every time he walks by the bowl, he notices that it's empty. That way, those two times a day, for in three minutes each time, there's food in the bowl, that's a very special, unique, something to take advantage of, kind of like driving on the 405. Uh, let me see, what else did we go over? Uh, we went over the three escalating consequences, or four escalating consequences to disagree with unwanted actions and behaviors. You might want to, uh, and we went over rules. Now for rules, we might want to put down some painter's tape uh, around the kitchen, like I described, as well as around the door. Um, we can also, um, uh, and for the painter's tape, what I do is typically I put it down and then the second week I go and I peel it up and I cut it into dashes. 
So I just I just take Exacto, and, they, and so now you remember remove every other dash, and then basically at, for the week he sees the dash. Then the next week I remove every other dash again. So gradually the line dissipates, but he still knows where the line is. Now I left a treat there for him. I didn't give it to him. I want the guardians and their guests to play a little hard to get with him. I think that they've been a little bit too accommodating. We do this to be nice, but I think it's confused him into thinking that he has more authority than he actually does. There's a lot of little things we do like that, like, a, like I said, petting without uh, any reason. If he's standing in my way and I walk around him, I'm deferring, I'm burning more energy so he doesn't have to. Um, uh, I'm eating, uh, letting him eat in front of me. A lot of these things coincidentally just give the dog the wrong impression. So make sure the humans are eating something first. If they're going out to eat, they just eat something in five more bites and then give him permission to eat. And use passive training. Every time he takes his first bite of food, maybe we say feast. So he has a funny word, and we can say feast, and he goes and eats that on command. Now, I also like to give dog directional commands. I went over this off camera. So what I would do is if I wanted him to get off the dog bed, I would uh, touch this, and I would throw it right on the ground. And when he got off, I would say off. I would do that for furniture. Uh, one of the rules is he's not allowed to be in the furniture. Um, but I'd also do it off this carpet. So throw it this way and that way and this way and that way. So we can teach him, say off, and he knows off means just get off the carpet in whatever direction. Because one of the rules is when we're eating food here, he's not allowed to be on the carpet. The rest of the time we can be there, just not when we're eating. Can't be in the kitchen when we're preparing food. The rest of the time I can be there. And again, to help him uh, recognize and respect these boundaries, we can practice, do dry runs. So maybe before we actually cook food, we microwave a piece of roast beef. And then it gives us the opportunity to practice having him exit the, exit the area. Remember when you're using the third consequence, you march directly to the dog, uh, at the dog until it gets across the boundary point, and then we take a step backwards, left, right, and we pause. The dog stays put, we take a left, right, and pause. Don't turn around because you're turning your authority away from the dog. Eventually you'll be able to do that, but when I first do it, sorry, when I turn around, but I'm like watching the dog as I walk away. So you do this in stages. Um, I also do that for every room in the house. I go to the room and I toss it outside and I just, like this, out. I would probably throw it a little bit further so he actually had to get off of the carpet, but you get the idea. Sit, passive training. Um, let me see, what else? Um, walks, uh, getting him ready for the walks. We, <laughs> excuse me, we went through that, bless me, um, or salute. Um, so we went through that, but by, by practicing the activity, remember, excited is not happy for him. So any other activity he gets excited about, we want to make sure, I could have put it in there and said stretch. Um, but any activity he does on a regular basis, we can train him to do that through passive training. Uh, now, when we do have a problem behavior, ask ourselves, have we taught the dog how we want it to behave during this activity? If we haven't, then, how, then we want to break down the activity, reverse engineer it, break it down in individual steps, and help the dog practice one step at a time in the easiest capacity possible. And then once the dog knows each step along the way, then we can kind of start putting it back together more and more realistic, real world situations, adding different elements and distractions. Eventually he can do the whole thing without any you know, real world situation because we've prepared him, we've taught him how we want him to behave, and we've helped him practice it. Uh, that's why we want to practice the door exercise. Also practice, uh, you know, like I said, for eating. We can do the same sort of thing with a roast beef or something else, microwave a piece of bacon, and sit down at your, at your place, and then anytime you cross the line, we enforce that boundary over and over. And once he lays down, or sits, or stops uh, trying to cross the boundary, then we sit down, and once he lays down or sits down, then we put the bacon away and we bring our actual meal in. Remember, um, when you're uh, walking to, uh, away from the dog, pause in between each step, and don't turn your back away from him. Um, what else do I miss? Missing Max. Um, I think, you know, oh, is it this? You just, you just lurched yourself at something. Um, if your dog does have, be oh, uh, an exercise journal, start an exercise journal, write down the date, the number of repetitions, and oh, that's where I was going. Um, we can help him be in a position to succeed. You wanna get that, buddy? You want me to throw it? There we go. Um, yes, he wanted to throw. Um, we can help the dog, uh, put the dog in a position to succeed for different activities. Like if we're gonna have guests come over, we need to get him a lot of exercise during the day before the guests come over. That's not gonna stop your problem, but it's gonna make it easier for him and make him less twitchy. Now he likes chasing the laser, so that'd be something to add to the exercise journal. Maybe we have, we stand over there by the stairs, we run him around the couch. Remember to put the laser up on the wall so he can see it as you're going, because otherwise the couch will block it. Then run him the carpet back here, then run him up the first flight of stairs and back there to the garage, and then do it, and that's a circuit. And so make him do loops and count the number of loops. Remember the first time, do it as many times as he can until he stops doing it, and that you know your maximum threshold. 
And then at the end of the day, you know, and also write down he nipped somebody, he barked this time, anything, anything he does wrong, put that in your exercise journal as well. Keep this for about a month and every day and be religious. It'll take you a couple days to get a habit of it and then you'll just do it. That way if you start, if he nips, we can look back at how long it's been since he had exercise. And when he nipped, write down that we had, you know, maybe we had some sort of Tom Waits plank. Tom Waits makes a lot of people annoyed. So whatever it is, we can find commonality. Music was playing, there was construction, there was, he was tired, it was before he, he ate, after he ate, food was around, or whatever it was. And we start seeing trends that we can actually start reverse engineering, helping him practice these different activities so we teach him how we want him to behave. All right, can we come back over here to sign off, Max? Oh, we taught him how to use this dog bed. We're calling it Beach. The Guardian might change it to something else. Um, and he really, he really got this pretty good. How about this, Can you go over there and get this one? I want you to turn around a better camera presence. Sit. This is Max, the Tibetan Terrier in Torrance. And this is Max's roadmap to success. Remember, everything you do trains your dog. Only sometimes you meet it.